Hey Booktube, it's Jackie, how's it going? If you're new to me and it's the first time you're seeing my face, hello, what's up? My name's Jackie, I sit on my floor and I talk about books. So I hope that's why you're here because that's what's gonna be happening today. If you're not new to me, thank you for always tuning in and continuing support, I really do appreciate it. So today for you, I have another book review and this is all on If I Were Yours by Ella Jacobs. Looks like this. This is the second installment to the Not Yours trilogy. I have done a full book review on the very first one, Not Yours to Keep. I'll link it up here in the corner for you guys. But if you'd like to find out what my thoughts are on the second installment to a BDSM Why Choose Romance Where the Relationship Goes South, grab yourself a drink, have yourself a seat, and let's find out what happened if I were yours. Okay, so I am really, really excited to talk about this one. Um, this one means quite a lot to me. Um, I did do a full book review, as I said, on Not Yours to Keep, which is going to be linked to the corner and the down box below. So you might want to go check that out as this is a direct sequel. So it's a direct follow-up of that book. You need to read that one to understand this one. The reason I'm so excited about talking about this one is Ella Jake was one of the very first authors to actually request and seek me out and request me to read her book. So this is like a coming of a full circle moment for me. So I'm really, really excited to get this to you, out to you guys and for her to see it. Um, it's been a long time coming. The book is already released. It released last month, so you can go pick it up. You can find it on Amazon um, in ebook or paperback format, as well as Kindle Unlimited. So a few stats about this book. So it is the second installment to the Not Yours trilogy. Um, it is a BDSM romance with an emphasis in, emphasis in the BDSM lifestyle rather than just sexual practices. However, in this installment, we get a lot more view, we got a lot more um, scenes in the BDSM sexual side as we did in the first one. So you do get to see a lot more of the super sexy fun times of the BDSM relationship, but it's still more primarily about the lifestyle included around one of these relationships. We do show BDSM practicings, including spankings, whippings, extreme submissive and dominant behavior. Um, we also have an emphasis in sadist and masochistic behavior in this installment, as one of our doms is a sadist. So we get to see a little bit more into his world. And some of these areas include erotic asphyxiation, humiliation and degradation, and salarophilia. I hope I pronounced that right. I'll write it right here so you can, it's right here. <laughs> um, so, uh, Yes, and we also have a, again, a dom choose, why, why choose element, because we have two doms. Uh, we also feature an age gap of 11 years and 20 years. Uh, there is graphic sexual content, and we also feature dubious consent in this as well. A lot of similar stats from the first installment, but we do get some newbies. Um, just so we're aware, because this is BDSM romance, I'm going to be talking about some terms that you might not be familiar with if you are not familiar with BDSM. So I'm going to go over a few definitions just to kind of help clarify anything um, if there's any questions. So BDSM actually stands for bondage, discipline, dominance, submission, and sadomasochism. Uh, bondage is the restricting of a partner's freedom and movement with ropes, handcuffs, and other restraint types. So that is the kind of the bound, chained, element of bondage a lot of people f are familiar with when it comes to BDSM. This is one of the more common things to think about. Um, it's also discipline. Discipline is the agreed upon rules and punishments for a dominant partner to exert control over a submissive partner. All consensual, but these are the rules that they have pre-described, decided to follow on both sides um, as the relationship progresses. They're open to change, they're open to adapting, things of that nature. We also have dominance, which is the act of showing dominance over a physical partner, either during sex or outside the bedroom. Um, in this installment, we do see a lot of it outside the bedroom and more inside the bedroom than we did the previous installment. Like I said, we get to see a lot more um, windows into the sexualized side of BDSM in this installment, which I really had a good time with. Um, Submission is the act of showing submission to the dominant partner's actions or wishes. And you see a lot of that in both the bedroom and outside as well in this one. Sadomasochism. This is a new one. This is one we get to really hit on um, in this installment a lot more than the first one. Um, that is the pleasure or sexual gratification that a partner may feel from either inflicting pain, which is the sadist side, or receiving pain, either physical or emotional. That's the masochistic side. And I want to emphasize it's more on... Um, in the beginning, it's more emotional, but we do see the physical side of the masochistic element in here. So we, we do get both perspectives of it, which I really, really enjoy that Ella Jacobs showed so many varieties of the BDSM world in this one installment, and as well as the first book. She does a really, really good job of 
explaining and giving us examples to really kind of give us a good footing of what we're looking at. We also feature dubious consent in this, um, and dubious consent was coined by the fan fiction community to make visible the gray areas between rape and consent. Um, for example, in situations where distribution of power may limit individuals' ability to give meaningful consent to sex. We do have some gagging scenes in this book, uh, which does limit the vocal communication of our submissive. And we also have a lot of clear-cut scenes where the sub is saying, no, stop, I'm done, I don't want to do this. And the action continues because back to the discipline agreed upon rules and punishments for a dominant partner exert control over submissive partner in that scope we have something called a safe word and she never safe words during these moments safe word is the code word to stop and in her experience the in her in our novel our heroine's safe word is shrek so until she actually utters that word the scene does not stop even though she is saying stereotypical things that we have been trained in society that if we hear no, we are to stop. So that's where the dubious consent comes in. So I want to make that very clear because there is a quite a few, there's quite a few scenes like that. Um, and I just want to make you very much aware of what that means. And that's the reason why it still continues because we don't have a safe word. But we will get into all of that. Uh, there's two other words I want to talk about. Um, erotic asphyxiation, that is the intentional restriction of oxygen to the brain for the purpose of sexual arousal. This is a new one for this story and I fucking loved it. I loved it. Um, this is one of my faves. I, I actually enjoy this um, element when it's in books, so I was really excited to see it in this. And then we also have salarophilia, which is the sexual fetish or, paraph or paraphilia that involves deriving erotic pleasure from soiling or disheveling the object of one's desire, usually an attractive person. This is where that humiliation and degradation element comes in. This is kind of the clinical term for it. Um, we do see the humiliation kink and degradation kink really heavily in this book uh, compared to the very first one. So we are experiencing quite a plethora of new things. So. A lot of a lot of definitions thrown at you guys there, but we're gonna we're gonna make our way through it. So before I get 100% into this, I do need to emphasize my spoiler statement because this is a direct sequel. I mean, direct. We pick up right where the first book left off. I mean, literally, this woman was probably writing this story and then wrote the first chapter of this book. It's like, no, I feel like I'm gonna cut it right here. Done. That's that's the abruptness of the cliffhanger in the first book. So when I have to go into this video and say this, I usually don't do spoiler warnings, um, but there is absolutely no fucking way I can talk about the second book without spoiling the first book for you. So if you have not read Not Yours to Keep, I have linked my review here, or if you not watched that video, stop this, go read that book, come back, and we'll party. If you have not watched that video, Go watch that video because I'm going to be referencing back to that video. Go watch it, come back, and we'll party. If you don't care about spoilers, then let's part. Let's let's just plow right through. But if you don't want to be spoiled, and I recommend not being spoiled for this book because it is a gem. Don't you don't want to be spoiled for that first book? You really don't. So if you've not read the first book, please pause this. Go read it. You can find it on Kindle Unlimited, um, Amazon, in paperback and ebook format please go pick it up. It's definitely something you don't want to miss. It's pretty special. And then come back and we'll talk more about this installment because there's absolutely no way I can talk about this book without spoiling the first one. But if you don't care about spoilers, here's your spoiler warning. You will be spoiled for not yours to keep in this video. And you'll be spoiled for my review of that video of that book in this video if you've not watched it. So it's your final chance to pause and go do it. But if you're ready, Let's fucking party. So, summary. Like I said, this picks up right where the last, where the first book ends. So, it is Gregory putting Clara to bed after letting her know that he plans on staying around, that he's going to give this a shot. He's going to try to be the Dom that she needs. And since she is going back home because Marcus has to go to um, go on tour she's going to be alone. So Gregory has agreed to go with her back to her home and be with her for two weeks. So she's actually only alone for a week before Marcus can come back and see her and be with her. So she'll be taken care of. Um, that is where our story picks up. Clara and Marcus are still the main relationship. 
Um, Marcus is her primary dom. Gregory is the third party that was brought into in the first book. And we're having this kind of three-way dom component. Gregory's aftercare fucking sucks. It sucks, okay? So there's a lot of trepidation going into this. Claire is a little worried because she's like, what happens if you do it again and you leave me hanging? I'm not gonna have Marcus to save me this time. I don't know what, I, I don't know how I feel, but she's so drawn to Grigory. There's this, there is a visceral attachment to him that she needs him. So she trusts Marcus' judgment that Marcus, because she's given all of her consent to Marcus in a previous dynamic that was already set up before the start even of the first book, she agrees to listen to him and trust him and say, this is going to happen. Okay, we'll do this. Okay. So Grigory goes with her to her home and we get right fucking into it. Holy shit. Ella was not holding back. She jumps right into it. I mean, we open the front fucking door and he tells her to go in the room, take her clothes off. Let's get busy. What? Whoa, we're seeing a whole nother side of Grigory. Whole nother fucking side. Like, whoa. Right off the bat, I'm talking like chapter two, people. Like, I'm pretty sure it was like chapter two that we were already into the thick of it. I'm like, whoa. And this is a dubious consent scene that's coming up because Claire is tired. She's exhausted. She doesn't really want to have sex. And he's like, no, you can't sleep yet. You need to take my dick first. Thanks and fucking go to town with it. But this presence that Grigory has um, with Clara and this, this, this aura that he has over her, she succumbs to it and she revels in it and she has a good fucking time with it. And through this two week time period and further on in the, as the book goes, Clara is exposed to areas of her submission that she wasn't even realized, she wasn't even aware that she had. and opened to new things that she's excited about but yet still is emotionally torn between because Grigory enjoys this but she knows Marcus is not into this we're talking gagging humiliation there's a few scenes where we have um some forcing of cleaning off some digits that were in, put inside of her and she just like I'm sorry what uh not for it but because this aura that Grigory has it's just subspace moment and she just wants to please him she just wants to make him happy because she is so deep in her submission for him because of all these new experiences she's encountered eventually all three parties get together and an incident happens where marcus thinks that gregory's crossed a line and it's actually marcus who has crossed the line and it brings to the forefront an issue that as the reader you're already seeing happen but now our characters know about it. so you were in on it for the characters everywhere and that was a really cool experience but it's bringing to the forefront this elephant in the room that people are changing people are growing people are adapting people are finding new things they like people are not being able to do what they used to be able to do and Clara is left to make a choice between the man that she loves and the man that she needs and goddamn, was this a fucking ride Oh my God, was it a ride? Mm. So let's get into what worked. So right off the bat, big thing for me in sequels, continuity. I have a huge issue when I have to stop reading a sequel and go back to the first book to understand what you're talking about. If I choose to do that just to refresh myself, that's one thing. But if I'm forced to do it, that pisses me off and I was not forced to do it in this book. There is no time in this book where I felt the need to actually go back to the first book to remind myself of anything going on. Any previous instances, any previous dynamics, any previous rules or understandings. I did not feel the need at any point in time in this book to ever go back. And I really, really enjoyed that because it never hindered my reading experience at all with this story. I thought Ella Jacobs did a fantastic job with her continuity. She gave me just what I needed at points and times to remind me of certain instances of emotional instances, physical instances uh, that we were relaying and re-experiencing back in this book or we needed to parallel from that book. She did a fantastic job with that. So if that is an issue for you, it's not going to be an issue for you. If continuity pisses you off because it's lacking, this book is not lacking. Trust me, you're in good hands. Um, I loved the more perspectives. So the first book is told pretty much primarily from Clara's point of view, a true submissive. 
So 100%. So there was areas of the book that were difficult for me to read and to understand and comprehend because I'm not really a submissive person. In this installment, we get still primarily Clara's perspective, which really works for the book. It does. The way Ella Jacobs tells a story, the submissive perspective is the perspective that really carries the most weight. But we got more from Marcus's perspective. We got some chapters of just his perspective and how he was dealing with issues within this dynamic that he's trying to create with Grigory and Clara and this how that we're going to do this balancing act. So I really enjoyed the um, extra insight into the primary Dom's perspective of how he was coming about some of these decisions and why he was making them. Because one of my issues in the previous book, in the previous book, was that I saw no conversations with his sub, um, so I only knew her reaction to his choices. In this installment, I don't get that every single time, but there are some choices and some reasonings that I'm given from Marcus's direct perspective. So it made some of these choices that he made a little bit more palpable and more understandable because I kind of saw the logic behind them. I saw the reasoning, what his reasoning behind the decisions he was making. I really appreciated that a lot. I thought that was gutsy of her to do because uh, she writes the submissive perspective so well that it was when I saw Marcus's chapter, I was like, how is she going to write the Dom's perspective? Mm hmm. Yay. I was excited. I was very, very intrigued. We don't get a lot of them, but the ones that we do, do give you some nice kernels and nuggets to kind of, kind of ease you into some of the bigger decisions that are made within this installment, for sure. Um, I loved where she took Clara. So Clara in the first installment, true submissive, doesn't really voice anything, never seems to really have a vocal problem. We got some internal dilemmas, but never really vocalized to her dom. Like she never really tells him, hey, I have a fucking problem with this. This is pissing me off. You didn't talk to me about this. This installment, we did not get blind faith. We did not get blind trust. We got some questioning. We got some, hey, you didn't talk to me about this. This is a life change decision. And I should have been consented. I should have been consulted about it. I understand you're my dom, but I should have been consulted. You're talking to me like I'm some fragile, broken being, and I'm not. And I love that. I love that. And the reason why I love this is because BDSM has a really, a lot of people think it's all about Dom, sub, sub cannot do anything. The sub has most of the power in a BDSM relationship. It really does. In the healthy ones that I have seen, the sub is usually the one that really retains all the power. And I saw Clara ex exude some of that power that she has within that relationship. And I really, really enjoyed it because Marcus and the way Marcus responded. So not only we have her voicing some of her concerns based off learned experiences from the first book, and that's what I wanna specify, is some of these are learned experiences. So she's not blind trusting. She remembers what fucking happened and she doesn't wanna go through it again because Marcus trusted it then and now he's telling her to trust it again. She's questioning his authority. And I thought that was really gutsy and really brilliant because the way she did it, I thought Marcus was gonna go postal, but he didn't. The way she had Marcus respond to it was very understanding, very, okay, I see where you're coming from. They had conversations, not really arguments. Do we get some arguments in areas? Yes, because every couple fights. Um, and we do have some where he kind of pulls rank. And I was able to deal with that um, because I still got some of that vocalization. I got Clara saying, especially in one of the scenes where we find out there's like a life-changing element coming in and she was not consulted about it at all. And she's just like, you didn't fucking consult me. And by the way, fucker, we talked about this decision that I made that you talked to me about in length we talked about it and you thought this was the best option and now you're telling me you were fucking wrong again? You can see the trust breaking down from Marcus and this pedestal that she has placed him on um, is starting to uh, stumble a little bit. It's not as steady as it used to be. And although you might think like, why are you, because I liked Marcus in the first book except for one major element and that was his lack of consent when bringing a third party into the dynamic. Having these conversations brought forth by Clara and having the way Marcus was responding, I really enjoyed that because I saw the inner workings of this relationship where it was no longer Dom and Sub, it was man and woman discussing what is best for each other. 
um, still inherently him making the final decision, but I really, really enjoyed at least her voice voicing it. Um, so her concerns were out there in the open when, if something were to go wrong, um, I, 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 I really enjoyed where she took Clara and I'm excited to see how far she takes her in that kind of vein. I thought that was fantastic. Uh, Grigory's growth, exponentially fucking amazing. So Grigory from the first book sucks in aftercare. Dominant mindset, oh, fire, fire. And he's fire in this book in the dominant world. He is fucking fire. Oh my God, I love him. I love his dominant side, but the side that we get to see this aftercare, the doting dom, the everyday taking care of, we really see him grow and really come into like his own in this or the way the book puts it coming back to what he used to be um, before his huge blow up with his ex-girlfriend, which we get to learn a little bit about as well, which I really enjoyed. We got some of his backstory and why he is the way he is and what caused him to change his uh, ways of thinking and watching him revert back in the aftercare, but at the same time still maintaining this very gruff Dominic series. Oh, I ate all of it up. I did it all up. He, his growth was exponential. It was fantastic. And I loved it. And we get so much more of him. So much more. So much. It was, it was fantastic. Because we primarily are with Clara and Grigory for majority of this book. Um, there was so much more spice in this book compared to the first one. The first one I thought was spicy. Oh, fuck no. Ella was holding on. Ella was... Hella was keeping some fucking secrets as she gave it to us because there was multiple times in this book I need to stop and go take care of some shit. Holy shit. There was so much more spice in this book. It was, we saw demonstrating new BDSM techniques, which was fantastic. So we got to see more of the bedroom side of it, which was awesome. I love the emotional side. I love the heart of a BDSM relationship that we saw in the first one. But I was lacking some of the uh, super sexy fun times and the fun toys and things. And we got to see more of those, which was really a good time. Um, I loved the fact that she talked about the fear element of trying new things and how nerve wracking could be to try something new, um, in a sexual relationship and just experience that experience. Cause everybody can relate to trying something new in sex. It's like, I kind of really want to try this, but I don't know how I'm going to react to it. And I don't know if my partner's going to react to it. I don't know if they're going to think I'm a freak or weird or if I'm going to like it. I mean, I know when I've tried new things with my husband that I had that fear factor, but having that that presence with me, I know it's going to be okay. And I loved that relationship that we got between Grigory and Claire, which was who we primarily see this with. Uh, this new experience, this new trial, coming into her own, learning new things about her sexually. Oh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Her spice scenes were fucking on point. Okay, the carnality of them, fucking on point. Had a great time with them. Um, I loved that Claire was given a choice this time. One of my issues was there was no consent uh, conversation with bringing her a third party. In this installment, oh, I see why Clara doesn't make fucking choices because they're emotionally draining and they're emotionally, the turmoil she went through. But I was so happy to see her get that choice, to actually have it put into her hands and say, look, this is all on you. I can't make this one for you because I believe in a BDSM relationship. Again, I am not in this lifestyle though. I am not. This is a tool that is in my bedside table that I pull out when I want to have some super sexy fun times and it gets put away. Other than that, me and my husband, we're like this. Where, I, where I'm sub, he's dom. Where I'm dom, he's sub. And we balance that shit out. But I love the fact that this choice was there because I believe in a healthy relationship that is something that has to be something this big. And it's a big fucking choice. It's a big choice. It is not up to the Dom to make his choice. This is a choice that's been made between both parties because it's a choice that literally affects the wholeness of their relationship, the unity of the relationship. It affects the relationship at its core. And I love that Marcus let her make that choice. Was it emotionally draining? Was it hard for her? Yes. But I loved it because it's a choice of what you want versus what you need. And that's a choice that everybody knows how painful and hard that can be. This was something I could really relate to. Not in the sense of what Claire was going through, but the, the idea that there is something I really want versus something that I really need. And how do I choose between the two? How do I go about doing this? And she makes a choice. She does. She makes it. And she had all 
of the tools at her disposal. She asked the questions, she got the knowledge, she got the history, she got the stories, she got everything that she could possibly get for the type of choice that she had to make. And I just thought that was great. I really, really enjoyed that growth from the first one um, with the author giving us that. I thought that was so well done. I thought it was on point. I thought it was great. Fan fucking fantastic. So many things worked in this book. So fucking many. Unfortunately, there were some still things that didn't work for me in this book and we are going to get to them. But because this is a direct sequel, before I get to what didn't work in this installment, I feel it's very important to discuss the issues that I had in the previous installment to see if they got alleviated, aggravated, or just kind of maintained. Um, so the previous issues I had in this book was this overarching feeling of justification why Clara wants to be a submissive. I felt in the first book there were times where she almost was justifying her behavior in a in a lifestyle that she chose to be in. And I didn't quite understand why that was happening. I don't get those justifications in this book. I did not get that. What I got, though, wasn't much better. I got this almost lack of choice. There was a lot of instances in this book during um, some sexualized scenes where in her internal monologues it was more like well I don't really have a choice so I'm just going to submit. Um, okay. It, it's almost the adverse like she's no longer justifying it she's just saying I don't have a choice I'm gonna go do it I'm gonna do it. So I didn't really get that that still kind of nerve me so it didn't really get alleviated. It just kind of stayed just recalling it something else. And so I'm really hoping the third installment that Jake was finds a happy medium between those two because either one doesn't really stick well with me, but I understand the reasoning for both, um, for both storylines. The first one is definitely introduction to this lifestyle especially people who aren't this lifestyle trying to say like, this is okay, this is acceptable. And in this one, it's like, look, this is trying to rationalize that sometimes I'm gonna be pushed to my limits because I have to trust my Dom that he knows that I can handle this. And so I don't really have a choice. I just need to go along with it because I need to trust them. So I understand for it, but it just kind of soured some of those decisions, which some of those big, there's one moment where she learns something about herself sexually. And I love that she learned it, but it was because she didn't have a choice and she lacked the willpower to stand up to his dominance because it was so overarching. And so it was kind of soured a little bit. And I was like, meh, that's sad. Um, my other issue with the first book was how Marcus introduces Gregory in the dynamic. I didn't agree with just the dropping it like a bomb. There was no discussion. There was no, hey, do you want to bring in a third party? She's like, hey, he's going to teach you piano and he's going to beat you. Use your safe word. It's okay. Everything he's going to do, I approved. Um, I didn't agree with the drop. So in this book, I didn't get any of that drop. There are instances where I get it, but we get a vocalized Clara coming back after it. So we got discussion and we also got a little bit of a backlash from Clara. So that got alleviated. And I really, really appreciated that um, because Clara gave, or Jacobs gave us conversations, but also when they did just do the drop and change of things, she's like, no, how is this okay? You didn't talk to me at all. Um, so I liked that we got at least something going around those and some acknowledgement when they just dropped shit on her that she was not prepared for and had no discussion about whatsoever. Um, I didn't agree with Marcus not being present during the beginning of the dynamic. Um, and this one, there, Grigory and Clara are together most of the time, but throughout the book, we're constantly informed that Grigory and Marcus are talking back and forth. So they're fully aware of everything each other is doing, um, except sexually. They, they have chosen to not sexually disclose what they do with Clara in the bedroom. But how she's doing, um, rules and rules that they've implant, uh, they've installed, they both discussed it because they are co they are like co-parenting her and co-sharing her. They're sharing her. But they're being very vocal about it. So we do see this conversation. So Marcus is aware of what is going on with his sub. Because Marcus is the primary dom. He is primarily in charge of her. Except when Gregory is present and Gregory is in charge. And that's kind of their the way they decided to do it. But they're still being very vocal. And I really enjoyed that. Because that alleviated that. Um, I have no idea what the fuck's going on in there. Um, now I'm fully aware of everything that's going on. And I'm fully aware of what's going to be coming down the pike. Um, at the end, we didn't get a consent conversation. 
Um, that's when we, uh, at the end is when we get the consent conversation in the first book. Um, we still get life defining choices made for her without her consent. Um, and when she does vocalize, it's like, yeah, we're gonna listen to you, but we're gonna pull rank and this is happening. So suck it up. And if you don't listen to me, you're gonna get punished for it. So we still have this like, that is still a fight, but that could be something that comes down later down the pike, um, getting alleviated because it is a life-changing choice. And that life-changing choice is kind of hanging in the balance right now at the end of the second installment. So I'm kind of like, mm, I feel like that's not done yet. So maybe, so that one just kind of staying right now for me. But those are all my previous issues with the previous book and how they got resolved in this book. So I was very, very happy about that. Uh, very, very happy. However, I still do have issues with this book. And these issues are what is with the new material only. That's why I wanted to go over the previous stuff. So I wouldn't include that um, again if it didn't get relieved. So now you guys know. And now we're going to go into what didn't work for all the new material in this installment. Um, like I said, I really enjoyed the more perspective from the Doms. Um, however, we don't get Grigory's at all. We get a little bit of Marcus, which I love and I appreciated, and we get a shit ton of Clara, but we get nothing of Grigory, nothing. And that's the one I, I want to know what's going on in his head. I want to know. So I'm really, really hoping that the next installment, based off the way this installment ended, I really hope she gives us something of him because I want to know what makes that man tick. I am so intrigued by this character she's created with Grigory. Seeing this other side of him, I want to know Every, I want to pick that man apart. So I'm really hoping that I get something of him. So this is not really a super big issue. It's just something I really fucking want. Um, and I thought I was going to be getting because I was getting a lot of alone time with Clara and Grigory, but we didn't get him at all. Like nothing. And I really wanted it a lot. So I'm hoping in book three. Fingers crossed. Yep. Um, there was this, this is the one that's kind of a struggle for me. Um, there's this fear element in this book. So we learn that Grigory is a sadist, okay? And a sadist is the, is the party that enjoys inflicting pain, okay? Whether it's emotional or physical, okay? Um, Grigory enhances fear in Clara. Clara already is extremely intimidated by Grigory's presence and his dominance. Like she, there, she can't stand up to him. Like the way Ella has written their relationship and their one-on-ones, it, there's very, she's intimidated by him. There's very little arguing with him. Um, and the few times we do get, I mean, they are squashed very quickly because Grigory rules with like an, almost an iron fist. And because of that, I didn't understand the reasoning behind invoking as much fear as he did. There were times where the character of Clara literally says she is scared. Like she's actually scared of him. And it makes for these emotional breakthroughs between this couple kind of soured because they're tinged with fear. And it's just like, you can be a sadist without giving the fear element. However, saying that the carnality written in those scenes, the fear element is a definitely an arousal method for Clara. But it's invoked to the point where it's almost comical. Like he's putting her, making her scared not for sexual arousal, but more for humor arousal. Because there's one scene where he brings in Marcus and they blindfold her and they literally are tossing her around. And Marcus says this, oh, she is really cute when she's scared. <clears throat> that line coming from the primary dom and then hearing Grigory kind of laugh about it Mm, I loved that scene so fucking much. 
I love that scene. I stopped after that scene and took care of a problem that that scene caused. But that fucking line, I just like, why? Why do you have to make her afraid for her own life? And I just, mm, it just, it did not settle me. But I understand that there are people out there that get that the fear factor is something that they need. They, they need that for that arousal. But she was aroused. It, it was another level that she was learning about herself. And I understand that. But the this is where it's hard for me because I can't put myself in that perspective. And Ella in the first book gave me other sides, other elements that I could fall back on that are non-sexual and non-BDSM um, to show me that headspace that Claire was in to kind of relate to. I didn't get that in this book for scenes like this. I didn't have that comparison moment where I could go back and say, okay, this is what you, I don't necessarily agree with this shit, but I understand because I can relate to this moment right here. Um, and I didn't get that. And I was missing that. I was missing that to understand this fear component. So the fear component just kind of sat the wrong way with me. It did. Um, so at the end, Marcus's decision, it's Clara's decision, but it's also Marcus's. Okay. Let's be honest here. Yes. He gave the choice to Clara and Clara makes it, but he also makes a choice to it. He made it prior to her making hers. And in the conversation about how, what choice she had to make without spoiling it, Marcus gives a thousand reasons why this needs to happen this way. Kind of already convincing her. It's something she already knew, but trying to bring it to the forefront in her mind. But I mean, he literally just makes that decision and, and does what he does. And I'm like, the fuck, man? What? Which brings me back to his original non-consenting of bringing a third party in. You, I feel like this was his way of taking himself out of a situation he no longer wanted to be in that was no longer benefiting him. With how easy he walked. How easy he made that decision. And that really sucked. Really sucked. Because when I saw that, with everything that we learned with the material for the decision, that she needed all that background that we learned, and that's still the decision you made, and you made it before she asked all of that, I just, I felt a little bad for Clara that she had to go through that. Um, because that I don't feel like was right. I feel like Clara deserved better than that reaction. And it bothered me. But, but we have a third book. So that could definitely be an issue later on. So I'm reserving my right to uh, one understanding it didn't work. It didn't work for me just because it brought me back to that first installment of that non-consent and it just carrying through like you were, tr you're trying to still fix what you fucked up before. But the third book, this could definitely be a major plot point for the third book. It could be something great. It could be something awesome. It could be super conflicty and super angsty. It could be awesome. So it could turn into something fantastic. So, yeah. Um, so we get to see extreme dominance um, from Gregory, like almost as if he is owning her entirely. We finally get to see this. And granted, it happens towards the end of the book and we don't get a lot of it. It doesn't look much different than um, beforehand when he was sharing her. It really doesn't look that much different. Minus two extra actions. It doesn't look hardly at all. Actually, what it looks like more is he has more space to do what he wanted to originally do. He couldn't do it in her apartment because it wasn't big enough. It wasn't set up right. I when with some of the information we got about him, I was expecting like a complete 180 and I got maybe like a little bit of a turn. I, I It wasn't that much darker. It just looked like he had the space to do it because that's what he originally wanted to do, but he couldn't do it in the space that he had 
like to be perfectly honest that's what it looked like and so I was kind of hoping for more which I hope we're gonna get more in the third book of this more extreme side of him this like complete and total you are mine kind of thing um because we only got to see a snippet of it but um from what we saw it didn't look much different the last thing I had kind of an issue with this book and I damn it if I am shocked as hell with this and this really threw me of why because I was not expecting this to be an issue at the fuck all um I felt like this book focused more on spice than the emotional attachment and the reason I say this is don't get me wrong I love a good smut book and these spice scenes like I said I had to stop I had to stop one time to take care of so there was a lot of times I had to fucking do that okay there's a lot of times there I don't think I was, I was wet for this entire book. Let's just be honest, I was, straight up. I had to recharge my toy like twice. Because of this book, it's fucking great. Sex scenes are, oh fuck, they're great. Oh, so good, so good, so good. But the reason I say I feel like it focused more on spice rather than emotional attachment is in the first book, and if you watch that review video, I say that there were times in this book it felt uncomfortable for me to read. It felt very uncomfortable because of who I am personally and kind of my my personality traits. There were times in this book where I felt uncomfortable. I had a visceral experience reading the first book. Um, I felt agitated. I felt unnerved. I didn't, things didn't sit well with me because I couldn't relate to the character. I couldn't understand why she would do this. I had to pick other moments to really relate to. And I didn't get a lot of those. A lot of the time, a lot of the stuff that Clara was going through, I couldn't 100% relate to because I didn't get the comparisons. And despite not getting the comparisons, I didn't realize that I was gonna miss that visceral experience from the first book. I hate to say this, but I wanted the uncomfortableness. I wanted the, this is not okay feeling and then giving me something that I can kind of relate to and then kind of coming out of it. I didn't, I didn't get that at all. I got more carnality, which I can totally relate to. I got a lot of sex. The emotion behind it, that, that sub drop, that subspace that Ella put me, tried to put me in in the first book, I didn't get that and I missed it a lot like a lot I even told my husband when I was reading this book I feel like it's almost written by a different person because the voice is so different I don't know if it was the growth in the characters or because she wanted to give more spice uh more of a power punch I mean she did but I didn't realize that that visceral experience is what I was going to take away from that other book and I was looking forward to it I didn't even realize that I was looking for that and after I would stop reading for moments I was sitting there I'm like where is it where why why am I why am I comfortable why why do I feel immune to this and further introspection of the book I didn't get that visceral experience and that's what I was counting on from her book because that was one of the things I loved and I didn't realize I loved um about this this series I people take away from what they want and I didn't realize that was a takeaway for me for the first time and I missed it so much like I still kind of feel after finishing the book I still kind of feel like I didn't I wasn't fully satisfied you know I wasn't fully satisfied because I didn't get that visceral feeling and I missed it. But that's not necessarily something that's totally wrong with the book. That's something that's wrong with me. Um, but what I want to point out the positive to this is that an author can write something that makes me feel uncomfortable, but yet I seek it out later on in their works. I was looking for that agitated experience and I didn't get it and I missed it because I was expecting it from her from the author and that is a sign of a really skillful author that you can 
take something that normally I shouldn't be seeking and make me want to seek it. You, you kind of gave me my own version of subspace, lady. Damn. Damn. Like, I feel like I don't have the aftercare right now. I, I did, it wasn't taken care of. Um, I, so for me, it didn't work, but other side of the coin, you can make me seek something out that I normally don't seek out and miss it immensely. Kudos to you. But what she did give me was an increased spice in this book and that was very, very satisfying because this is four chili peppers. This is four. Um, so many more sex scenes with multiple BDSM techniques, uh, sadist, mask sides, um, heavy emphasis on them. We get some dirty talk from Grigory who, I can only imagine what an audiobook of this is going to sound like. I am just picturing his accent and I am dying. I want an audiobook. Like, you should get on that because his voice in those lines, mm, gold, erotic gold, I'm telling you. These dirty lines were fucking fire. If you enjoy the humiliation kink, degradation kink, you're gonna like these scenes because they are fucking fire and on point. Um, I really enjoyed how she used humiliation as the opening to showing Clara's masochistic side, um, just her shame and then eventually ownership and acceptance of it, especially in front of Marcus, who is not into that. I loved that acceptance and that embracing and that scene where she finally opens up and is like, I like this and I want this. And the way Marcus responds to it is not shame or, oh my God, you're a freak. She's like, I don't want to be part of that. You and Gregory can do that. I'm not down for that, but I understand. We all have our own things and we grow and evolve. And I loved the way that that was all handled. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I also thoroughly enjoyed Gregory forcing her to clean his fingers off after he, finger after he fingers her. I fucking loved that. That scene, multiple scenes, fucking fire. That's a great goddamn move. I'm just telling you right now, it's a great move. Um, awesome. Love that. Love that. Loved it. Fantastic. And the way it was done was great because he just the, I can, I clearly saw that entire scene 100% and I was just applauding internally the entire time because it was epic. It was epic. I just, mm. the first time he makes her do it and her inhibition and fear and he's just like, keeps prodding her to do it and coaxing it out of her because he sees it oh well done well fucking done the gagging scenes are great the breath play mm, girl after my own heart okay girl after my own heart i love this shit um and i don't see enough in books and i i i loved it i love the way it was handled i love the way it was described during the release moments and how like 10 times more powerful it can make orgasms oh Nailed it. Mm, it was so good. It was so good. Um, I also love the new tools and scenarios. We got to see a ball gag. We got to see some whippings. Um, we got to see some interesting ties. And we got to see a remote vibrator, which was really cool. And I will never watch Shrek the same way again. Just saying. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> it was, that was a great scene. And I'm like, I need... That one might get tried one time, just say it, because that was awesome. That was a great time. Um, but yeah, four chili peppers on this. I had a really good time with the sex scenes, a lot more than the first one. Uh, you get to see a lot more of them. Uh, yeah, I had a really, really good time with this, which brings me to my final thoughts. My final thoughts. It felt like a different author a lot of this book. Um, I, I miss that visceral feeling I received in the first one, and I'm still missing it. And it, it didn't feel like the Jacobs that I got to know in the first book, which is not necessarily a bad thing because it shows involvement. It shows growth as an author. 
And it shows that the fact that she can create something in me that I didn't think I would actually miss and I actually fucking missed it. Like I, I'm not kidding you. When I was reading this book, the first couple chapters, I'm like, why am I not feeling uncomfortable? Why, why am I not uncomfortable? And I, and I clearly say, I'm like, I'm, I feel like I'm missing, I miss that feeling. And my husband, who was around when I read the first book, saw me viscerally react to it. And he's like, you actually miss it? I'm like, yeah, kind of. Like, part of the experience. I want that visceral reaction. And I really only got it the one time, and that was with the fear factor. But I kind of rationalized it because I understood why he was doing it. But at the same time, I didn't understand to the degree that he was doing it. Um, and the, the comical part of it, I just, I didn't find that appealing at all. Um, but th other than that, I, I didn't get the squirmies and the uncomfortable and then that, that release of that uncomfortableness going away. I, I never got to fit in, experience the uncomfortable. It was just kind of like this erotic as fuck, but like this emotionally. So I was like, Hmm, uh, but it is a second book, so that could be growing. We, we did get a lot of plot development in this book, so I'm hoping that that comes back because I actually really missed it a lot. Um, I feel like if you, um, I, same way I fell with the first book, if you like BDSM romances, I believe you will enjoy this. If you are into sadist, sadist and masochistic tendencies, um, if that's kind of your kink, I think you will really enjoy this. Um, because you do get to see it predominantly throughout the entire of the book. Um, and you get to see somebody, um, favoring it, um, that didn't really experience in the first place and learn to embrace it. You get to see the, the, the blooming of their excitement and their experience with it and their fascination with it. You get to see the birth of it almost. And, um, I still think that this book would facilitate conversations, especially for anybody trying to do a three-way dynamic or a three-way in any type of relationship. Um, the the big elephant in the room usually comes to play and it was handled really well in this book. So I still think it would facilitate conversation between BDSM couples and um, sharing dynamics, if that's something that you're into, for sure. I... I enjoyed the added spice in this book. I thought it was much more erotic. I was much more turned on in this book than I was in the first one um, by far. I'm not kidding you. I stopped multiple times reading to go take care of shit and then come back to reading because it got to the point where I couldn't. And that fucking three-way scene. Ugh. That was just pure fucking poetry. That thing was fucking dope. Mm. I'm telling you, that's a takeaway fucking sex scene from this book. It was... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a good time. It was a good fucking time. I re might have reread it a couple times. Just saying. I really enjoyed it. Um, but honestly, with the ending of this book, I have no idea where the fuck this lady's gonna go. Have no idea. Couldn't tell you because it wrapped up really nicely. So I have zero idea where she's going to go with it. Like there's, there could be cliffhangers. There could be some areas where it could be for um, further drama in a third book. Um, but I don't know how because it seemed to be wrapped up. It, it, the way it ends, it's like, there you go. I, I, I don't know where she's going to go with it. The ending of the first book, I clearly knew where we were going. We we're going to see how Gregory and Claire were handling in this installment. This one, I feel like we're going to get more insight into the relationship that she chose and kind of how it develops. And with the new, with everything new that we've learned in this book, I feel like we're going to see that. But other than that, I have no idea where she's going to go drama wise. And I'm really curious. I don't want to say anxious. Because this ended on such a pleasant note. It really did. Um, I wouldn't say it's a true HEA. But it's a it's an ending that if she never wrote a third book, it'd be okay. But if she writes a third book, I have zero 
fucking idea where she's gonna go with it. Zero fucking idea. Because there was really... There were some things, but they're all speculation. They're all speculation of might possibly be brought into the third book. Um, nothing that I can concretely point to be like, yeah, that's gonna be a problem. That's gonna be an issue. So, I don't know, but... I had a great fucking time with this book. Um, my final rating for this is actually only three stars um, because I missed the visceral experience with this book and I didn't realize how big of a factor that was for me in the first book. And when I sat here trying to figure out what worked and what didn't work, that was the kept thing that kept popping my head. It's like, you don't have this. I, I didn't feel as satisfied as I was in the first book. So I gave a final rating of three stars, but God damn, if I'm not excited to finish this series and to my author, Ella, thank you so much for coming back to me and asking me to review your book again. I, you have such a gift with stories. You really do. This is not a story that I ever seen before. I've ever seen before. And the fact that you made me miss something that's uncomfortable and it was difficult for me to read and you made me miss it. Like, I really do feel like you kind of created my own little, my version of kind of what a subspace would feel like in your books. And I miss it. And I want to feel it again. So I really hope to you, God, you give it to me again. I really hope you do. Because your story is amazing. Your characters are amazing. And where you're going, I have no fucking idea none <laughs> I have none and maybe that's a little bit of the anxious maybe it's a little bit of, maybe that's where the visceral feeling comes from because I have no idea what you're gonna do with it maybe maybe I am experiencing a little bit of that fear that you talked about in your in your book fear of the unknown I'll see you next time guys